We've been thinking about um, particular um, ideas and, um, uh, and angles and viewpoints folks said in the past. If we shifted to maybe particular periods or individual figures, I mean, in a sense, your answer to this is going to be, I want people to know about everything. <laughs> but if you're, if you're the pastor of a church and, peop- and you want people to get hold of one particular individual or period from church history that's really going to help them, in their own life as a Christian, where are you going to go? Mm. Well, um, you know, yeah, there are obviously lots of answers to that, and that's going to, you know, depend on one's individual yeah. tastes and preferences. But for me, I, I do think that for, um, um, from in my own life, let's put it that way, mm. I have been most helped and shaped by the uh, post-Reformation uh, English Puritans. And uh, there, you know, why, why is that? Well, in part, these were people, so these are people writing in the late 16th century and in through the 17th century, so uh, late, six, uh, late 1500s into the 1600s. And, um, you know, they just put out this incredible body of devotional literature, uh, this incredible wealth of um, commentary on scripture, uh, sermons, um, all sorts of, investigations into the Christian life in in sort of sometimes it can feel like exhausting detail but they really just turn over what is it what does it mean to be a Christian what does it mean to be godly mm. uh, and they just have a very searching sort of um, mm. comprehensive vision for living the Christian life that, that I found really helpful and and really encouraging and one of the things that I think is encouraging you know we were talking before about each era has its own sort of strengths and weaknesses and Often, when I read these Puritan authors, I see them, um, I, I see strength there where I see weakness in myself. So, uh, for example, you know, I, I look at myself and I think I'm, I'm, pretty, um, I'm pretty soft in a lot of ways. I'm used to incredible material comfort. I mean, by any global or historical yep. standard, all of us in this room <laughs> live like, you know, kings and queens. <laughs> and uh, you're reading people who had to uh, struggle uh, greatly with just the basic material necessities of life. And, you know, that perspective um, shapes their outlook. And and I find when I read these Puritan authors, they seem less surprised uh, than I often find myself when faced with the reality that, yes, uh, the world has fallen and the creation itself is groaning yeah, yeah. and waiting for redemption. They, wow. they don't seem as surprised that life is hard and that um, sometimes bad things happen and uh, wow. loved ones die. I mean, uh, you think about somebody like John Owen, Puritan mm-hmm. pastor, who had, I think he had 11 children. Oh, he and lost so, almost all of them. All, all of them, them but them. one I think, uh, died. And then one of them died as a teenager, isn't that correct? That that does ring yeah. a bell, yeah. I, I think mean, it was, to- it was a really... Yeah, I th- and I think his wife died before him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, the poor mm-hmm. man had to bury his entire family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think one of the last books he wrote was Communion with God. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, mm. but I, I don't know if our audience has read it. I, I, For me, I think Communion with God, outside of Scripture, is maybe the book that has helped me the most just in terms of being a Christian and coming yeah. before. And he wrote at the end of his life, the poor man had to bury every member mm. of his family. Mm. And the way he talks about it. It is extraordinary, isn't it? It is extraordinary. I interrupted. I'm sorry, Matt. Actually, Matt, please. just on that, communion yeah. with God. I mean, John Owen's big can be hard going to read, but mm. there, there is a kind of simplified version out there, isn't it? Is it Kelly Capic? Is that Yeah, the one? that's right. That's right. K-A-P-I-C, and, if people yeah. want to pick that up. Can, can I make an appeal for the original Owen, though? I find him very difficult to read, bad English, but I find if I read him out loud, I can hear what he's saying. Oh, uh, interesting. And actually, I think there's a kind of sermonic influence. I, I feel like he's preaching to me. And I find it a lot easier to keep up with him if I'm reading him out loud. That's just yeah, me. Maybe okay. other people have a different experience. But mm. I, Actually, can I just, just on what you were talking about that made me think, um, I mean, I'm verging into your territory, so you can tell me more about this. Uh, a couple of years ago, I read John Flavel, Flavel, Flavel? Not sure. Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> he was a pastor in Devon, wasn't he? Mm. Um wrote a book called, is it The Mystery of Divine Providence? It's a book on Providence. Yeah, yeah The Mystery of Providence. And yeah. I read that, what you were saying just made, made me remember it. He says things about Providence, and clearly he was saying this t- to his congregation, that I, that I would never say. So at one point he said something like, 
Um, he's talking about marriage. He said, maybe there have been people, married couples, he said, I think there probably have been, where they have been too devoted to each other and it it was clouding their devotion to the Lord, so the Lord took one of the mar- one of the partners away in mm. in death. Wow. And I remember thinking, wow. did did you actually sit in? <laughs> did you actually say that in your pastoring? I I mean, I have no idea if he was right to do so, but it, for me, it was one of those moments of just like you were saying, he he took seriously the realities mm. of suffering and deprivation. Mm. And grief because because it was daily, you know. He spent a lot of time ministering to, to people who were going out onto the high seas, you know, sailors. He wrote he wrote these amazing sermons for ship captains to read mm. out on ship. He's just living the realities of death every day, mm. and that would have led him to say that kind of thing. Wow! And as you say, it brought me up short. I I'm not surrounded by that. Yeah. Well, and, and I and I ought to take it far more seriously than mm. I do. And you don't have to completely agree with everything you said the way you said it to no. benefit from it. Exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you could look at that and you could actually say, I, I don't think that's a helpful thing to say from the pulpit. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the fact that he would have said that, it just is putting you into this radically different frame yeah, and yeah. challenging some assumptions I have because maybe I'm not going to go uh, full flavor on mm. that particular point. Yeah. But maybe I could be a little more bold <laughs> okay. in underscoring are some you, very biblical... Don't uh, go at full answer, but don't go full flavor. <laughs> what, are, what are some other names from the English Puritans who are really meaningful and been really helpful for you? Yeah, um, it's so there, there, there's there's a lot. I mean, really, one one thing that I um, students often ask, well, which which... Which would you, should we read? Um, one thing I tell them to remember, uh, I, I don't want to say you can't go wrong, but at the same time, when you think about something like the Banner of Truth that puts out these Puritan mm. paperbacks, mm. those Puritan paperbacks, it seems like there's a lot of them, and there are, but they have selected those 50 volumes or whatever from a vast sea of printed material. The, the early modern mm. period in England sees this explosion of print culture. And so they are selecting from hundreds, if not thousands, of devotional treatises, these that they think would be helpful. So there is a sense in which pick one that interests you, and it's already been hand-selected from a much larger catalog. That being said, um, one one that I would mention in this context is, is Richard Sibbs. Mm. And um, if you've heard of Richard Sibbs, you often hear of his the bruised reed, bruised reed, and the smoking flax, which yeah, which yeah. is a, which is a great is a great one. Um, there's one I I like uh, just as much, if not more, though. It's similar kind of theme. It's it's uh, called the soul's conflict with itself, mm. and it's an exposition of I believe it's Psalm 42. Why are you cast down, O mm. my soul? Mm. And he's just really examining and turning over um, this sense of of spiritual. Um, I mean, we might call it spiritual depression, however we want to call it, this, this sense that I, I don't feel the realities of the gospel in the way that I know I should feel and the way I want to feel. Wow. And he's turning it over. And what I find really interesting about it is that, um, one, he has a remarkable, I think, sense of psychological sophistication. Mm-hmm. It's not a 21st century psychological sophistication, mm. but he acknowledges a whole range of things. So, for example, he acknowledges that one aspect of feeling low may very well have a biological basis. Now, his biological basis is all about yep. weird humors and sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, too much sure, bile sure. or whatever. Sure. But the point is, he he's he's he is seen that there's a lot of different reasons why we feel low, mm-hmm. um, which is another reminder that that people in the past sometimes aren't as as dumb as we think they are. You know, <laughs> um, but the other thing I I think is interesting and. Um, you know, one thing that characterizes Puritan preaching often is that they will, from our perspective, really sort of belabor, you know, a very short section of Scripture. I mean, we often preach, you know, when I go to preach, you know, you take a pericope, you take a section, a passage, and, yeah, and, yeah. and it, they will take a, a verse or half a verse yeah, yeah, yeah. and just preach at length. So here is Richard Sibbs expositing, uh, why are you cast down my soul, um, just for pages and pages mm-hmm. and pages. Mm-hmm. And we might think sometimes they get the balance wrong. Do they read things in that aren't there? Maybe that's a fine debate to have. But um, whether or not they read things in that aren't there, they certainly get a lot more out than we do when we're continuously preaching from longer sections. And it's just another point of cultural sort of discontinuity that I found really interesting. I make. Hey, this could be another podcast. I make a bit of a song and dance in some teaching here about what's to be learned from Puritan sermon application. 
Mm. We don't necessarily want to go all the way there. I think there's a. I think Jim Packer has a line in um, Among God's Giants, his kind of introductory book mm. to the Puritans. He he says something like, "This is not an exact quote." Um, the Puritans on sermon application and the way they're applying into the soul is one of their great gifts. 